and welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered together with you for worship this morning. This morning, as we continue in our series, Sing the Wondrous Story, we will hear the words of famous hymn writer Fanny Crosby, who was born in Putnam County, New York in 1820. At the age of just six weeks old, she was struck blind due to suffering and illness. Fanny Crosby would go on to become one of the most prolific hymn writers and poets, bridging the gap between the 19th and 20th centuries. But her life was not an easy one. She knew struggles many would never even dream. Yet the word of her hymns don't declare struggle. They declare hope, joy, strength, assurance, and most importantly, grace. Please stand and sing with us.
Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Father, we come this morning surrendering everything to you because you are good, because you love us and you care for us. Your mercy goes beyond what we could ever think, imagine, or hope for. And so your people are here this morning ready to bow down our hearts and our heads to you, to worship and praise you because you alone are worthy of all of our honor and glory and praise. Father, thank you for meeting us here in this place this morning, and thank you for gathering us together once again, the people of God in this place. Lord, thank you for this day. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 
Well, good morning. morning. And welcome to worship here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered with you again this morning. Uh, If you are here for Sunday school, make your way to the back of the sanctuary. Your teachers are ready to gather together with you this morning. Just like last week, we have a rather lengthy list of announcements to get through this morning, which is such a great thing because that means that we have lots of life happening in this place, and that's uh, also an amazing thing. Um, Before I get into the list, I do just want to say one quick thing. Thank you to everybody who came to the movie night last night. It was a very, very fun time. We had a great time watching the the Bridge to Terabithia, and I think all of you who were here will agree it was a a great evening and uh, a great movie, and we're looking forward to the next one in March. So if you missed last night's, there's another one coming up in March. We hope you'll join us for that. Uh, This coming Saturday, uh, February 3rd, can you believe that? February 3rd uh, is our um, our first uh, Saturday morning uh, fellowship breakfast and Bible study for 2024. Uh, That begins at 8.30 in the morning with a hot cooked breakfast uh, and fellowship. And then we will have study um, for about 45 minutes or so after that. We're usually done and wrapped up by 10.15 or 10.30 at the absolute latest. Uh, we would love to have you join us for this. This is, uh, there is a free will donation, but if that's a problem, please just come. We'd love to have you come and, and enjoy breakfast with us. And of course, fellowship and study. I'll be leading study. Um, it's just a great way to get your weekend started. So join us Saturday morning, 8.30 a.m. for our uh, fellowship breakfast and study. Also, um, next Sunday, uh, February 4th at 2 p.m. is our um, special presentation by Ryan Carp, our missionary from uh, Chosen People Ministries. He is going to be here presenting on uh, God's roadmap to peace in the Middle East. Just had a phone conversation with him uh, this past week. He's very excited to be back with you all. He wanted me to say um, thank you to the many of you who have been uh, communicating with him online uh, via email and other ways. He's very eager to come and see you all again in person. Um, So he's excited to be back. We hope that you took those um, little brochures and you can hand them out to your friends and others. Uh, There are more of those available at the information desk if you would like to have more of those. But this is going to be a great opportunity to hear a little bit about what the Bible has to say about the conflict that's happening in Israel and Gaza right now. So this is uh, a great opportunity. It starts at 2 p.m. It is a coffee house style conversation. So there'll be coffee and all the other other kinds of beverages, um, as well as some snacks and treats and so forth. So please join us for that next Sunday. Tuesday Helpers happens um, in about a week or so on uh, February 6th at 9 a.m. If you are someone who is retired or happens to be home on Tuesday mornings and can give us about two hours of your time, uh, we would love to have your help. Um, This is a, a little bit of a work Uh, work day, and uh, we are going to once again focus on the sanctuary and the space behind here, which we didn't get to do this past month because of the cold. So hopefully it won't be negative whatever it was the last time we were supposed to do this, and we will uh, be working in this space. So that is Tuesday, uh, February 6th at 9 a.m. Feed My Starving Children is coming up on uh, February 10th, 11.30 a.m. We meet at Feed My Starving Children in Schaumburg. Um, So be there by 11.15. We are wrapped up by about 1 o'clock. If you are planning to sign up or planning to help us, please sign up at the um, information desk in between the bathrooms this morning so we can get you registered and you can get all of the confirmation emails and so forth. Um, New Members Luncheon is coming up on Sunday, February 11th, uh, 11.45 a.m. That happens right after this worship service. It'll happen um, in the uh, preschool classroom. So if you go down the steps and just keep walking down the hall, the first room on the right, um, there will be a a luncheon provided for you, um, as well as information about the church, our governing policies, and what it means to be a member of Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We would love to have you join us. I'm thrilled there's uh, several names on the list, so that's great news. Looking forward to uh, being together with you for that. Sunday, February 11th, 1145 a.m. Still plenty of time to sign up if you're interested in that. 
our Lenten dinner discussion series starts uh, on Wednesday, February 14th, Valentine's Day, also Ash Wednesday. Um, that dinner and discussion series is a series that happens every Wednesday during Lent. Um, dinner begins at 6 p.m., and then study will follow at about 6.45 or 7. This takes the place of our Wednesday evening study. Um, <clears throat> dinner on the 14th on Ash Wednesday is going to be soup, salad, and bread. And then we have a series of things each Wednesday evening during Lent beyond that. Um, no need to sign up. Um, for these dinners. You can just come if you are able. Uh, we always have dinner beginning at six, uh, but we try to keep things hot and out throughout the night. So if you're one of those people who has to commute home from work or something of that nature, please just come. There's sh sh food should still be out and you can join us when you get here and grab a bite to eat. These are free will donation. Anything you can um, add to the, to the donation certainly helps us to be able to provide the next week's meal. Um, Looking forward to all of those. Our theme for those this year is grappling with the weight of our sin. Um, our Sunday morning series for Lent this year is sackcloth and ashes. We're going to talk about the historic reasons why um, people of faith practice the art of, uh, the art, the practice of sackcloth and, sackcloth and ashes um, to repent of sin. And so we're going to just dive a little deeper into that on Wednesday evenings. Also, February 2nd, or February 2nd, February 18th, Sunday, February 18th, is our Texas Roadhouse Dine to Donate fundraiser. Uh, that Sunday, instead of sticking around for coffee house, or coffee house, uh, coffee hour afterwards, there's too many things up there. Instead of sticking around for coffee hour after church, uh, join us at Texas Roadhouse after church, anytime between 11 and 3 that day. Um, if you take in the flyer that we are going to give to you next week, I believe, correct? We'll have those flyers for you next week. If you take that flyer with you and you give it to your waitress or you give it to them at the time that you pick up an, an online order or something of that nature, 10% of your order will come back to the church as a donation uh, that whole time, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, the other thing we will be able to do is give you um, a PDF version that you can email to friends and family. We can give you as many copies of that brochure as you want. You can hand them out to all your neighbors. Um, this is a great way to help us um, uh, and our bottom line here at the church. So that is Sunday, February 18th. Those brochures will be available starting next week. I think those are the announcements. Jeannie gave me the thumbs up, so that's great news. Um, also today, we have the opportunity to join together as a congregation to install our council members for 2024. So if at this time, all of our council members would please come forward. Not all of you at once, though, okay? <laughs> And I know everyone's going, where's Joyce? Um, Joyce, unfortunately, is uh, having a pretty serious um, back issue, and so she was unable to be here today. But just pretend she's standing right there next to Dale, okay? Um, not to mention, she's been through this about 8,000 times. So um, it'll, Joyce, we know you're watching online. We're, we, are, we are with you, and we, we know that, that you're, you're doing this at home as well. So <clears throat> start this way. <laughs> Beloved in the Lord, these persons have been solemnly chosen and called by you as a Christian congregation to take part as members of the administrative council in the care and the service of this church. They have accepted your call. No one has come forward to urge any just ob obligation I'm sorry, any just objection to their being set in office. I therefore proceed in the name of the Lord to set apart each in his or her own office to the work and the ministry among you and in your behalf. So brothers and sisters, as it is a great honor to bear office in the Lord's house, so it is also a solemn trust which no one should take upon himself or herself rashly or lightly. 
For although your election has been by the free choice of your fellow members, you are not to regard yourselves merely as servants of men, but also as servants of Christ. You should therefore magnify your office and make high account of its duties as a service to be rendered unto God and not simply unto men. Council members are appointed to assist and support the minister of the word in the general government of the church. You form together with the minister in each particular charge a council in common for the spiritual supervision of the flock which is committed to our care. You are to be the advisors and the counselors of the minister in the discharge of my holy office. You are to be to me the hands and the eyes acting with me and for me, representing uh, my presence throughout the congregation. It is your province to go before the flock in the way of Christian example, to watch over it in the Lord, to take an active interest in its spiritual welfare, to feel a responsibility for its condition, and to be at hand in all circumstances with spiritual aid for its necessities and its wants. To you, moreover, in conjunction with myself, belongs the whole discipline of this church, its power of the keys as exercised in both the form and the censure and the form of restoration. You are also appointed to assist and support the pastor and the ministers in the ministries in which pertain to the more outward needs of the general household of faith. You are to aid in the securing of funds necessary for the support of the church in its various activities. And you are to labor among the people in making known to them the needs of this church, fostering the principle of stewardship and thereby cultivating the spirit of liberal and cheerful giving. In discharging these duties, however, you must not lose sight of the true spiritual character of your office and remain always a proper branch of the Christian ministry, requiring virtues and merits of like sort with those which are needful of the office of ministry in its more exalted character. And so having well considered the nature and the design of these sacred offices to which you have been called by the voice of this congregation, Do you accept the call as coming from God? And do you undertake the work and the service that it sets before you in the name and only for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ? If so, please answer, I do. I do. And do you recognize the Holy Scriptures, both the Old and New Testaments, as the Word of God and as the ultimate rule of Christian faith and practice? If so, please answer, I do. do. And do you promise to exercise your ministry as council members among this people with faithful diligence according to what you have now declared to be the rule of your faith, showing all proper regard for the lawful authority of the church and taking heed to your own lives that you may adorn the gospel of our Savior by a walk and a conversation answerable to the place you occupy in the church of the living God? If so, please answer, I do. do. All right, thank you, each and every one of you, and I welcome you to your positions on the council. And because at the end of 2023, uh, Jennifer Elliott, who served as our chief administrative officer, ended her service um, time, We have a new chief administrative officer, so I introduce to you Lane Camps, the chief administrative officer of our council, Um, and just so that you know all of our officers, Jill Mix is our secretary of record, Dale DeVita is our building and grounds uh, coordinator, and Jennifer Schacht is our chief financial officer. So will you please give a shout of praise to the Lord for our council. Thanks, everybody. In your bulletins this morning, you will also find our prayer list. We'd ask that you would keep that handy this week. Thank you for your prayers for those folks throughout the past week. And um, 
I'd ask that perhaps you would also include the council in that list this week as we uh, pray for the council and for their work and their administration of this church as well. Would you please join me in a general word of prayer? Father God, we do give you thanks and praise for this place, Cornerstone Faith Community Church, and for all who worship and gather here. Father, we give you thanks for our administrative council, for those who have answered the call to come and serve. Father, it is not um, a simple task to be called to serve in leadership. And so, Lord, we do lay these folks before you, and we ask that you would give them courage, that you would give them strength, that you would give them wisdom, that as they lead this church, they would lead with faithfulness, that they would lead with a willingness to present the gospel boldly, strongly. Father, even now as we install a new council for 2024, we are reminded of over 140 years of administrative councils in this place. We give thanks for so many faithful men and women who have served in this place. Without them, we would not be here. Father, we ask for each and every one of our ministries that we would be faithful to you, that we would be faithful to your gospel, that we would be willing to share your gospel at every turn. Lord, for this we need your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would bless us with that, with its wisdom and its discernment each and every single day. Father, this morning we also lay before you our prayer list. Lord, there are some who are sick. There are some who are injured, some who are grieving, some who have great need. Father, there are some who have just endured trials. There are some who feel every day is a struggle. There are some who are facing new struggles today. Father, would you meet each and every one of these needs? Would you be the great physician and the great healer? Would you bring the great comforter? Would you bring peace? Would you tend to our relationships, our marriages? Would you be Jehovah Jireh, God our provider in every way? And Lord, now as we turn our hearts to your word this morning, would you once again bless us with the wisdom, discernment, and power of your Holy Spirit in this place that as we hear your word, it would fall fresh on us and on our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to hear the word of the Lord this morning, I would ask that you would please stand as you are able for the reading of God's word, that as we hear hear his word, it would fall fresh on our hearts and in our minds. Continue our look at God's wondrous story this morning. This morning we are in John chapter 14, hearing Jesus preaching to the disciples. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, may God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Francis Jane Crosby, perhaps better known as Franny Crosby, was born March 24th, 1820 in Putnam County, New York. At just six weeks old, Franny was stricken blind due to improper treatment of an illness. When she was 15 years old, she entered the New York Institution for the Blind, where she received a first-class education and became a well-respected teacher for that institution, teaching English grammar, rhetoric, and American history. Now, during the vacation breaks that that institution would take, Frances would spend time in Massachusetts, where she often took the opportunity to write poems or lyrics for the school music teacher, Dr. George F. Root. But writing musical lyrics was not her first love. In fact, Miss Crosby prided herself on the fact that she had met dozens of notable people in American history during her time serving at the institution. In fact, here's some of the interesting um, people in American history that she had met. She met President Martin Van Buren, President Zachary Tyler, the Honorable Henry Clay, who served as Speaker of the House of Representatives at the time. She met Secretary of State William H. Seward. And here's one of local interest. She met General Winfield Scott, for whom Winfield is named. Fanny wrote about her visit with Henry Clay noting that when he visited the school, she was selected to write and recite a poem for him. Just six months before that visit, Clay's son had been killed in action during the Mexican-American War and the Battle of Monterey. Now, Fanny had uh, sent some verses to Mr. Clay at that time when his son had died. But now she needed to be careful that she didn't repeat these words to him. She didn't want to make any allusion to him about his son's death. Apparently, whatever the words were that Fanny wrote to him in the visit to the institution, Mr. Clay was so moved that he stepped up to her 
took her hand in his, and the two wept together. Fanny Crosby simply had a gift for words. In 1858, Fanny was married to Alex Van Alstein, a fellow teacher at the Institution for the Blind, and after her marriage, she became acquainted with Mr. William B. Bradbury, a music teacher from Brooklyn, New York, and owner of the Bradbury Piano Company. It was through her friendship with Mr. Bradbury that Fanny would begin writing lyrics for Sunday school songs. Interestingly enough, Mr. Bradbury, apart from his work with Fanny Crosby, he would have huge success in writing church school songs for children. Now, surely you know at least one of Mr. Bradbury's church school songs. Jesus loves me, this I know. From Sunday school songs written for the congregation, Fanny Crosby took to the art of writing lyrics and poems for church use. Throughout her life, Fanny Crosby would write numerous hymn texts. No less than 62 of those hymns were initially published into hymns used by churches. Some of these hymns that we have to thank Fanny Crosby for include... Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Sweet hour of prayer. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. And... All the way my Savior leads me, the song we just sang. Fanny recalled one time in a discussion with a newspaper reporter that at the age of just eight years old, she penned her first poetic lines. Those lines, Crosby remembered, were my life's motto and are still to this day. Here are the words that she wrote at just eight years old. She said, oh, what a happy soul am I. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. I have read several books over the years about Fanny Crosby's life. Each time that I read her story, I can't help but be reminded in some small way about the story of Mary Ingalls, the elder sister of Laura Ingalls Wilder. You might recall that Mary Ingalls was also stricken blind at a young age, because of typhoid fever. She too traveled away from home to attend school for the blind and she too became a renowned teacher. If you ever happen to see the Michael Landon directed TV series adaptation of the Ingalls family, you will probably recall the frustrations, the inequalities, even the discriminations that Mary experienced as a blind person in the late 1800s. Surely, Fanny Crosby experienced quite the same discriminations and difficulties. That makes her story of success one that blows my mind, especially since she is one of the greatest writers of Christian hymns of all time. All told, Fanny Crosby is credited with writing more than 2,000 Christian hymns in her lifetime. Many of her songs were published using a nom de plume, however, or a pseudonym. Fanny Crosby is credited with no less than 45 different pseudonyms. Why so many different names? Well, simply because a blind girl from New York in 1858 wasn't every publisher's first choice for writing music. But Fanny didn't give up. Fanny Crosby once said of her blindness that if it had not been for her affliction, she might not have ever been given the opportunity for such a fine education, the chance to have such a positive influence in the world, or, or the reason to develop such a prolific memory. And what a memory she had. By the time of her death, Fanny Crosby had memorized the first four books of the Old Testament, the four Gospels, and several other books in between. That's a commitment to God's word. 
The third verse of Fanny's hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, that we just sang a moment ago, is an absolutely fitting tribute to her life, uh, her resolve, her commitment to the Lord. Fanny knew not just what it was to go through each and every day, but more importantly, who it was that got her through each and every day. Listen to the words one more time. It says, all the way my Savior leads me. Oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit, clothed immortal, wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. In the days and the hours before his arrest, the Savior Jesus spent a great deal of time with the disciples, teaching them, pouring into them everything that he could, everything that he knew, everything that he knew they would need to know once he died and was risen from the grave and ascended back to heaven. The text that we read this morning is a very familiar one, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. But within that very powerful statement is this conversation with the disciples, and especially with one disciple, Thomas, who seems not to exactly understand what Jesus means when he says, I am the way. As New Testament believers, you and I, we have the entirety of God's word, and we have had the opportunity of hearing the truth of Jesus from the apostles and from the prophets, and we might look at Thomas's doubts, and, and we might wonder, how could he have missed what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way? It wasn't that Jesus was giving Thomas and the disciples some sort of complex Google map to follow. He was simply telling them that he alone was the only way to the Father. Yet if we place ourselves in Thomas's shoes for just a moment, maybe Thomas's misunderstanding isn't so hard to believe. After all, Jesus says, you know the way to where I am going. I mean, it sure sounds like Jesus was suggesting that he had given the disciples some sort of secret treasure map. Pastor Tony Evans writes this. He says, Thomas had misunderstood. The way mentioned in verse 4 isn't a path. It's a person. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christ is the universal point of access to God. If you want to know the Father, you must come to him through his Son. Jesus assured Thomas that if he knew the Son, he knew the Father. Anybody ever been to Disney World? I've only been to Disney World once. Frankly, that was enough for me. I'm good. I had the opportunity to travel to Florida in 1996 with my high school band. We were invited to play a concert in uh, the band shell in Main Street, downtown Disney. It was a pretty incredible trip. We left for Florida three days before the concert. We played our concert, and then we had another day to explore again. Three days of fun in exchange for one afternoon's work. Not a bad deal. One thing that I do remember about that trip, though, was riding on the tram that takes you around the park. You see, in order to travel from our hotel to the park, we had to board our charter buses then be taken to a tram stop. Then we would board the tram and ride the tram into the park. Now that was the easy part. The hard part came when we had to board the tram and make it back to the buses because you see, you had to be able to board that tram at exactly the right stop. If you didn't get on at the right stop and off at the right stop, well then you had to ride all the way back around the park until you got to the right stop in order to get off and get back on the buses. So to assist groups like ours, the folks at Disney provided two guides. These guides wore red vests which had lettering on the back that simply said, group guide, follow me. Now I assure you, if we had not been provided those guides, the group that I was partnered up with, even with the adult chaperones, we would have never found our way back to the appropriate tram stop and back to the buses. The experience for me 
was a lot like Thomas's experience. There was no paper map to follow. Instead, I was asked to follow a guide, a person. Someone had been entrusted with my protection, my safety. Imagine for a moment being blind in any era, but perhaps especially in the middle of the 19th century, the 1800s. Now imagine being a young girl like Fanny Crosby, who is blind, making your way across the state of New York to study at an institution that you are unfamiliar with, to live with people that you do not know. What Fanny needed desperately was at the very same time the thing that Thomas needed desperately, which is also, by the way, the same thing that you and I need desperately. The very same thing. What they all need, what we need is someone to lead us. I think this is what makes this hymn that we are focusing on today such a powerful one. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? In other words, Jesus has always been there walking with me, protecting me, leading me, getting me to the destination safely. What more could I ever possibly need? But that very statement begs a question for each of us today. Does does your Savior lead you all the way? way. Who is it that is leading you? Or maybe the better question is, who is it that you are following? See, the truth is, your life will be the plain and clear evidence of whoever it is or whatever it is you have chosen to follow. If you have chosen to follow Christ, your life will be the fruit and the evidence of that. But if you are following someone or something else, the fruit of your life will look much different. So with the time that I have left today, I want to dig into Jesus' words to Thomas and the disciples as a response to Fanny Crosby's hymn. And I want you to discover this. Four evidences that it is truly the Savior who leads us all the way. The first one is this. Your heart is not troubled because you believe in God and you believe in Jesus. That's the first evidence that it is truly the Savior who leads you all the way. Your heart is not troubled because you believe in God and you believe in Jesus. Now, yes, I know, it sounds pie in the sky, It should come as no surprise to us that the disciples' hearts would be troubled at this point in their journey, by the way. After all, Jesus has just made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I know, we're about six weeks early. Go with me. He's made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He has made it abundantly clear to the disciples that he is not the warrior king that that they want him to be, that the whole Jewish people want him to be. What's more, Jesus has just told the disciples that one of them is a traitor and is going to betray him to his face. To top it all off, Jesus also had a conversation face-to-face with Peter, and he made it clear that when push comes to shove, Peter is going to deny Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. No wonder the disciples are having a little bit of a problem following Jesus. Dr. Warren Wearsby suggests that the problem is not so much that Jesus was so full of bad news, but rather that Peter did not know his own heart nor do we really know our own hearts except for one thing. Our hearts become easily troubled. And our hearts do become easily troubled, don't they? If we're being honest with ourselves, our hearts become pretty easily troubled. Sometimes it doesn't take all that much for us to work ourselves into a tizzy. That was Jesus' first point to the disciples this morning, by the way. If we're going to translate Jesus' words into a sort of modern, everyday language, here's what Jesus was saying to the disciples. He says, hey, guys, settle down. What are you so worked up about? Listen, you believe in God, right? This is Jesus having a conversation with his disciples. You believe in God, right? You believe in God, right? Oh, I thought maybe I went to the wrong church this morning. 
so why not believe in me? So why not believe in me? I'm standing right here in front of your face. I've told you God sent me. I'm his son. Why not believe in me? God's prescription for heart trouble is very simple. Trust. Trust God. Trust God's plan. Trust Jesus. Trust that Jesus is God's plan. Trust that you are part of God's plan. Trust that Jesus is God's plan for you so that you can trust that you are part of God's plan. So the first evidence of someone who truly believes that Jesus is the Savior and that he is leading them all the way is that they have exchanged their heart trouble for a trouble-free heart simply by believing in God and believing also in Jesus. Now, one little point of clarification. That does not mean that simply by believing in God, all of a sudden you'll never have trouble. Simply believing in Jesus does not make you trouble-proof, but what it will do is it will change the way that you approach those troubles. Believing in God, believing in Jesus is the difference between approaching troubles with a frustrated and weak heart or a confident and peaceful heart. He's got this. So when troubles come, don't let your hearts be troubled. You already believe in God, right? So believe also in Jesus. And face those troubles head on. He is leading you all the way. Here's the second evidence that it is truly the Savior who is leading you all the way. You rest confidently in the truth that Jesus has prepared a place for you. The second reason to believe in Jesus, interestingly, has nothing to do with this life. In Jewish customs, it was traditional for a father to add rooms to his house when his son got married so that the son and the new wife would have a place to live. The idea behind this was simple. Just because the son was growing up and potentially leaving the nest and getting married, the father didn't need to abandon him, shouldn't abandon him. So in the same way, Jesus, he might be getting to leave the family, But he wanted to make this one thing clear. The father hadn't abandoned him. In fact, his father had already prepared a place for him. And what's more, Jesus says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. In the same way that Jesus called the disciples to trade their troubled hearts here on earth by trusting in him, Jesus now calls to them to trade the the death that this earth has for them by trusting in him. When it comes to the end of this life, we need not fear, for Jesus the Savior has gone ahead of us to prepare a place for us. If it were not so, he would have told us. Perhaps the most important detail Jesus gives to the disciples, and to us, by the way, about the place that's being prepared for us is this. He says, in my Father's room, or in my Father's house are many rooms. Or if you're a King James person, right, in my Father's house are many mansions. That sounds even better. In other words, there's a place for everyone in the Father's house. Now you might say to me, really, Pastor? Hold on a second. There's a place for everyone in the Father's house? Yeah. There's a place for everyone in the Father's house. God has room for everyone. Not everyone will accept his offer and take up residence with him. For you see, these rooms do have certain reservation criteria. These rooms are reserved for the redeemed. Those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. So while God has plenty of room for everyone, not everyone will accept the criteria required in order to check in. But for those who do accept the criteria required, those who do believe in God, those who do believe in Jesus Christ, those who do trust Jesus as Savior, those who do confess their sin, who turn away from the sin, who are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, there is plenty of room. Come on in. The Father's house has many mansions. By the way, you ever think your house is a little too small? God's got a mansion waiting for you. That's evidence. That's proof positive. Jesus is leading you all the way. Third evidence 
that it is truly the Savior who is leading us all the way. You know the way to where you're going because you know the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. There's an important point that Jesus makes when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus does not merely point the way to the way. He does not merely show the way to the way. Jesus actually functionally is the way to the Father. But what does that mean? Bill McDonald says uh, he is the way. Salvation is a person. Accept that person as your own and have salvation. Christianity is Christ. The Lord is Jesus, not just one of many ways. He is the only way. No one comes to the Father except through him. The way to God is not by the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, ordinances, church membership. It is through Christ and Christ alone. Then he says this, Today, many say that it does not matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. They say that all religions have some good in them and that they all lead to heaven at last. But Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Do you want to know a truth that startles most people? If you do not believe in Yahweh God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and in Jesus Christ, his son, the full propitiation for the sin of mankind, you will not find yourself in heaven. That's a startling reality that troubles people. Jesus must be the payment that cancels the debt of your sin. Jesus' death must win life for you. There is no other option. You cannot save yourself. Neither can anyone or anything else save you. There's literally no other way to the Father, to God, than Jesus himself. Is that exclusionist? Yes. But God is exclusionist. He has always been a jealous and zealous God. He doesn't want some small piece of you he wants all of you to himself. It's God or nothing. It's Jesus or nothing. It's God and Jesus in life or nothing. The evidence that truly it is the Savior who leads you all the way is pretty simple. He is your way, your truth, and your life. Here's the last one for this morning. The last evidence that it is truly the Savior who's leading you all the way you have a fervent desire to really know Jesus and thereby also really know God. I'll leave you with this one last illustration for today. It is no secret that when, very rarely, Sarah and I get an opportunity to be away, take a vacation, I think the word is called, the one place that we really like to visit is Louisville, Kentucky. A couple years ago, we spent about seven days there. The first couple of days, because we were staying in a different suburb than we had stayed in before, we needed to get a bit of a lay of the land. But by the third day, we felt like we figured out the intricacies of the area. We began to be able to predict the traffic patterns, and we even discovered a few back roads and shortcuts to our destinations. As we spent that week in Louisville, I realized something. When you live in a certain place, you really get to know that place. That's obvious, right? But when you're just visiting, even though you might come to know the area quite well by the time you leave, you've probably only scraped the surface of what you really can know about that place. For instance, when we got back home from Louisville, I looked at the map again, and I realized that the entire time we had been there, we had been taking a particular main road to get to the highway, which functions as a bypass around Louisville. It turns out if we had just turned right out of our hotel instead of left, we would have found ourselves on a secondary road that was a much faster link to the highway would have saved us all kinds of traffic. We just never thought to turn right. I wonder how well you know Jesus. Some of you might say, oh, well, I know Jesus really well. 
After all, I have been with him for 30, 40, 50, 60, stop me when I get there, 70, 80 years, 90 years, Miss Vivian. Some of you might say, oh, well, I really could know Jesus better. I know him, but I, maybe I don't know him that well. And some of you might say, I don't know him at all. Just as the evidence that a person really knows the place where they live is seen in their ability to navigate around the town, the evidence that a person is truly led by the Savior is evidenced by a true, fervent desire to really know him. But then once you know him, to know him even better. To know him even more. How does the world know that you're a Jesus follower? Because you really, really want to know Jesus. And even though you know him, you want to know him more. You're never done knowing him. Because he leads you all the way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for our Savior who leads us all the way. Lord, I don't know where everybody's at this morning. I don't know if there are some who would say, I, I really don't know him. Father, if there is even one person here this morning who says, I don't know him, Lord, will you come to that person? Will you wrap your arms around that person? Father, will you help them to know you? Will you help us to help them to know you? But Father, for all of us, no matter how well we think we know you, no matter how well we think you lead us, will you help us to be led better by you? Will you help us to know you better? And that begins with us getting out of the way. That begins with us recognizing that you alone are the way, the truth, and the life. So, Father, starting now, starting small, starting tomorrow, starting Tuesday, starting this week, help us to know you fully as the way, our way, our truth, and our life. That we might really know you and then know you more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, people of God, say it with me, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Now, say it the way you mean it. He is your, hold on, your way. So my way, my way, my truth, my life. Brothers and sisters, as you go from this place today, go with the one who is your way, your truth, and your life. The one who is leading you all the way. And go with the love of God our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.